All right, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1 here, please. And I, I, I want to do some explaining here to you, and, and I, I've got to... I don't know how much of this I'll get through here this evening, but I, will fin- I can always finish it and split this in two and finish it on Sunday morning, and also I'll have another follow-up. Uh, this series that I've just been burdened to start here, that the Lord has burdened me to start, and I, I started studying this. I mean, I've studied it a long time, I mean, in different ways, but, but specifically I started reading and studying this on Sunday night after church, Sunday afternoon. And I couldn't stop it. I couldn't stop. I, I, I had been, I've been studying it ever since. I haven't stopped, really. I mean, I did a little bit of break for the Baptist Battle for Liberty show that I'm doing tomorrow. But other than that, I just, I, I was so, it just vexed my soul. It just honestly vexes my soul. And I, I've got to preach about this. I, I've, I want to give you a background kind of at first here. Of, I, this series is going to be called The Evils of Evolution. All right? But... I need to introduce you to really the real man who really Charles Darwin was, amen, and kind of explain to you some things about who, who Charles Darwin was. Uh, let's, let's read, we're going to read this scripture starting in, in Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. I'm going to read this to you, and then I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to kind of give you an introduction here and explain to you exactly who Charles Darwin, Charlie Darwin, the, the modern day father, so to speak, of evolution, which isn't really true. He's actually a thief, really. But, uh, and he just, he's, he works for the devil is what he did. He worked for the devil. And, and, then, and then anyway, so let's, let's, let's pray first. Father, Lord, I pray you bless us. Help us now, Jesus. We need you, Lord. And I don't even like talking about stuff like this a lot, Lord, but I know it's vexing. But who this man is is important to understand, Lord. This man, what he promoted and, and his demonic disciples after him, has caused so much damage in this world. It has caused so much wickedness, so much death, so many wars, so many babies that have been murdered because of these wicked men and because of the spirit that's behind them, Satan. And Lord, I pray that this series would be used to help some people understand this, even some that are are, are believe in the theory of evolution but don't understand there's a demonic side to it, there's a wickedness a si- side to it that nobody knows about, that many don't even know about who the, what these men were into, who they were, what they liked, what they promoted, and how they were taught. And Lord, I pray that this would open the eyes up of some who have been fooled and deceived and blinded by Satan. And Lord, I pray it would strengthen your saints so they could go out and give an answer. And it would be on the authority of the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead. Look at this. So that they are without excuse. You know, sometimes, sometimes we think that we need to get all scientific with people when we're out there and they throw up these objections to us. They throw up these things and they're like, oh yeah, well, what about this? And what about this? And they try to scare the saints. They try to scare you with all this, this science and tech, these technical terms and all this other stuff. They try to intimidate you with it, but you must never forget that your authority as a believer is the word of God. It isn't some facts. It isn't some scientific manual. It isn't anything like that it's the bible it's always the word of god and they don't have an answer for that and they're without excuse because that when they knew god they glorified him not as god they knew god see charlie darwin he knew who god was i didn't say he knew him as his savior and his lord but he knew who god was When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. But look at this. There's nothing more vain than evolution. I'm sorry. There is nothing more vain than evolution. Nothing. Nothing. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Their foolish hearts darkened. Listen, you're going to see this lived out in Darwin's life. If we even get to the end of that tonight, which we may not. But look at this. This is, this is like, I mean, God wrote you 
everything you need to know about these people right here. And I mean, all over the Bible, but right here, he wrote you everything you need to know. Listen, this is like a blueprint of destruction. If you deny the God of the Bible, this is what your nation will turn into. This is what your culture will turn into. This is what the world will plummet into. And did it not happen? Haven't we seen it? This is exactly what happened. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Oh, yeah, they're so smart, aren't they? They're so wise. and so You're so, it's like that guy that stood up there and told me in that video from Planned Parenthood with all his fundraising sheets and everything standing there, and he's looking at me and said, I, I go, so why do you think it's okay to murder babies? Can you answer that? Can you answer me that? Could you tell me why you think it's okay to murder babies? Do you think it's okay to kill people? It's not a person. He said, it's not a person. It's not a person. That's how he talked. I'm not making fun of him. That's really how he talked. He said, it's, it's a potential person. It's not a real person. That's what he said to me. What, you, what, what a potential person? He said, he said, it's a potential person. So, so it's okay for you to kill potential people? It's just stupid. I'm sorry. It's so dumb. It, does, it, it doesn't even deserve uh, any respect at all. It's just foolishness. It is foolishness. But this is a blueprint. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a to corruptible man. What do they got? Where's your lineage at? Well, you know, look at this. Here it is right here, right? God, God's not God any longer, right? They changed that image, right? They changed it, changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Well, what do they say? Didn't they say like the, the bird? They say the bird is related to man, right? Right? They say all, we're all just related. We're all animals. We're all just related, right? Four-footed beasts and creeping things. Yeah, that's what you used to be. That's what they say. That's your grandpa. Yeah, they are creeps. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. Didn't they do that? Isn't that what evolution does? Changes the truth of God into a lie? Don't you understand that Darwin, Huxley, and all of them, their only goal was to deny the authority of God? Don't you understand that is every sinner's goal is to deny the authority of God so they do not have to answer to Him? Stop making it any more complicated than that when you deal with sinners on the street. Tell them the truth, sinner. You don't want to recognize the authority of God. You don't want to be accountable because there's an answer you're going to have to give and you don't want to give that answer. So you pretend like it's not real. I don't care for your foolish questions. I'm not going to sit there and answer all your foolish questions. Why? Because I know you don't care. I could give you answers, and you really don't care about the answers. You hate God. That's what your problem I've told him before. I look right at him and say, you hate God. That's what your problem is. Quit lying. Darwin hated God, and I'm going to prove he hated God. He hated who God was. For not believing somebody existed, he sure had a lot of hate for him. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Hey, he's not real, right? What's the matter with you? Why are you so angry? They rage because they know he's real. And they know they're going to answer one day. For this cause, look at this. What happened next? Oh, wait, let me back up here. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So what happened? Hey, Huxley didn't even get it. Huxley did not even get it out of his house before, or didn't get out of this life before he saw a raging homosexual walk into his house. And he was not a homosexual. He was not walk into his house and flame in front of him, do all this. And you know what he fe- you know what he feared the most? Oh my goodness, I caused that. That's pretty much what he said. I'm paraphrasing it, but that's what he said. I-, I caused that. He feared that that was his brainchild. Well, Brainiac, it was your brainchild from Satan. But that's exactly what it was. Because when you deny the Bible, it's back to the jungle, baby. That's what it is. You're going to be swinging through trees. Acting worse than a bunch of animals. And what do we have today in society in America? God gave them up. 
That's what so, so was our society. You went from evolution to the homosexual revolution to the sexual revolution to the homosexual revolution. It's, it's all. It, it was about God said. Here's the blueprint. He said, if you the people that do this, this is what happens. He warned. I mean, everybody you, you surprised. Really, who's surprised? You shouldn't be. God already told. God wrote it before Darwin stuck his nose in it. God had already written it in heaven, amen. God already had it forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven, amen. God had it up there, and what did he say? (laughs) They're going to do this. This is what they're going to do, and what did they do? This. This is what they did. This. He already said they would do it. If this doesn't prove the authenticity of the Bible, I don't know what does. Right? Right? This is the foreknowledge of God, right? God said, okay, well, they're going to do this. This is what's going to happen. Watch what happens. This happened. Everything here has happened. Everything. And what does it start with? The denial of God. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. And worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. What do they, what do they worship? A monkey. They say man came from a monkey, right? They worship animals. They worship the creature. They worship the creation. They worship something that is made. Well, they don't believe it's made. They believe it kind of just, I don't know, flatulated or something. It just came there. That means a gas. Sorry if you don't know that, but I'm trying to use a nicer term. But uh, anyway, but that's that some bubbles just boop. There it went. Just like poop in water. That's what happened. Just like that. Hey, that's what they believe. They don't believe in the, we, they make fun of us because we believe in the beginning God. They believe in the beginning Slime, I guess. Right? Bang. You ask all of them where it came from. Where did the Big Bang come from? But we don't. Well, we don't really know the answer. I, I'm not going to have that conversation with you. Wait a minute. So you, get, you didn't see no Big Bang happen. How come you get to believe that, but I can't believe in the beginning God? But you get to believe, you get to believe that, 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 uh, that in the beginning, boom? Okay, so you believe boom and I believe God. What's wrong? Why do you act like you're better than somebody? You still believe it by faith. You just have faith in your devilish book, which came from Lucifer, by the way. Okay, I got to keep going. I know I could, man, okay. Anyway, and likewise also, by the way, for this cause, God gave them up into vile affections. Vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use of that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which is meat. What's that? I know it's a lot of things, but it probably could. It, it's probably a good idea that it's AIDS. Yeah, grid, that's right. AIDS. AIDS, right? Transmitted diseases, sexually transmitted diseases. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? Yeah, confusion of mind. Insanity. Being, look at this, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they did not like to. Darwin did not like to retain God in his knowledge. He warred against God. He did not want to retain God in his knowledge, as we're going to show you here. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, believe me, whispers, backbiters, haters of God. Well, that's for sure. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Yeah, boy, I mean, you couldn't write the list any better, could you? Amen. It came from Almighty God. Disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without... Natural affection. That's for sure, right? When somebody can laugh. When somebody walks up to Brother Paul when, when, we're, at, when we're out preaching and the lady goes, yeah, I had an abortion. And she was laughing about it. Yeah, she walked up to him and said, I killed my fetus. I killed my fetus. Ha <laughs> ha. She said he saw, she saw Paul there last week at the when she killed her baby. She said she saw him preaching outside of there. Do you understand? Do you get it? Do you get it? When you deny the God of the Bible, when you teach people these things. This was one of Darwin's. Actually, he had a fear of this, that it would that society would degrade. But he loved his demons more than he loved the truth. All right. 
who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Okay, we're going to start with Charles Darwin here and his devils, his mentors, his Masonic connections, just who he was a part of and why. Why do, I want to, why do we need to do this? Why do we need to give you a background of Darwin and everything? Well, I need to give you a background, first of all, because I want you to understand something. Most people out there that study evolution and everything, here's what they think. Well, it's just scientific. I mean, that's all it was. It was just science. I mean, they figured it out by natural science. I mean, Darwin, you know, sailed on, what was it called, the Beagle? That's gay. But anyway, he sailed, he sailed on the, he sailed on, I'm sorry, it's just really, it is, I mean, hi, ready to go on the Beagle. I mean, just, I'm sorry, there's just nothing cool about that at all. It's really sad. All right, I got to keep going. But anyway, um, Darwin, Darwin and his men, who is he though? Who is he? Nobody really knows who this guy is. Most of the people that study evolution, that just believe the theory that you and I talk to on the street, they don't have any idea of the satanic influence that Darwin had in his life. They don't understand that this is a war against God. That's all it was, was a war against God. That's all it's ever been. But listen, folks, here's another reason why. We, we don't even understand as Christians, we don't even understand the absolute impact evolution has had. We don't understand it. We don't understand evolution in the new age, which we're going to talk about, that evolution prompted the new age and pushed the new age. We, 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 don't, we don't think about that ever, but it did. It prompted the new age. Uh, what did Aleister Crowley have to do with evolution, Huxley, and all those people? We're not going to talk about that tonight, but we are going to talk about that in the future because here's a witch and everything else, and why is he a part of all this? What did he have to do with all this at this time? This industrial revolution, this time over in, 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 uh, in England at that time, and in, in, in Europe, what was going on? I mean, what about, what about abortion? I mean, you would, without, you would not have a Margaret Sanger if you did not have a Charlie Darwin. You would not, the eugenicist movement, right? The eugenics movement. You would not have a eugenics movement if Darwin and his wicked, demonic, devil Huxley and his other, his, and his other uh, apostles of evolution didn't go out and preach it everywhere and popularize the theory. You wouldn't have eugenics. Racism, you wouldn't have the, the absolute racism that went on today and the destruction of races that, wants, that they want to, you, that's evolutionary. That hate, that, that, that. I mean, Darwin was a racist. All of them were racist. So easy to prove. I'm going to prove it. And there was, there was, there's, I mean, there's even more. There's, there's more of the, of the social changes that took place. Okay, let me ask you a question. If God, if this, if this didn't happen, do you think we'd really be having a conversation right now about, about why a transgender boy gets to walk, a boy gets to dress like a girl and walk into, uh, public school bathroom, uh, with other girls and shower with other girls? And now they told this, now in Chicago, they've told them that you can no longer, they had a private stall for this transgender kid to take a shower in. Now now they just told him today, they just said to him today, they said, you know, we got we to gotta do away with that shower, that, that private stall. He's got to have access just like everybody else does. So he gets to walk amongst your naked daughters there. Well, not mine, because my daughter would never bathe in front of a bunch of people anyway. It's a bunch of sick perverts. What kind of design is that anyway? I'll tell you what it is. It's Darwin's design, because nothing matters, right? There are no absolutes anymore. Do you understand? Do you understand how far you take this? The homosexual revolution, the sexual revolution, the, 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 the sexes not being any different, the sexes being the same, the unisex revolution, everything else, the Baphomet wicked spirit that's out there today, all of that stuff. All, yeah, the, the, the mental health, the mental health in America and in the world, the drugs, the medical mafia. Do you understand that we would not have a medical mafia if it wasn't for Darwin and his evolution? Do you get that? No, you don't. But I'm going to show you in this series. I'm going to show you. That's exactly. You wouldn't have people giving you funny pills like that and doing things to you like that and telling you and manipulating your mind and doing all those things. What is, what is most medical, what is most of the medical profession based off of, Nate? Evolution. You see, there's a difference here. There's a difference. The Bible, when it treats something, it treats it from a creation perspective. When most doctors, most mad scientists cre uh, uh, treat something, they treat it from what position? Evolution. Get it? Right? And most doctors think they're God. How dare you not come to, how dare you not accept my 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 advice here, my my opinion on this or my direction on this for your child? I'm gonna stick that needle in your kid anyway. Right? You're non compliant, right? We gotta stick you with this needle. Right? We gotta take your tonsils. Why? Well you didn't need those. Those just evolved kind of there. 
You have vestigial. That's right. That's right. Just like that tail you used to have was vestigial. So it, it fell off and you didn't need a tail, right? It's vestigial. Sorry. Anyway, it is stupid, isn't it? Uh, but, but do you understand how all this is impacted? Do you get it? How all, all evolution is impacted? And there's more. I don't even have everything here, okay? Uh, you'll hear it. I have a lot here tonight, so I'm going to get going here. And, I, and you're going to have to bear with me. I'm going to be reading some quotes and things to, to you. But I want you to understand how this all happened, how this man came to this, and how it got. Listen, can you explain this any other way besides there was, a, the, there was the devil's spirit behind it to push this? Because how in the world could you ever get something so popular and so powerful without against the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth if it wasn't for a demonic spirit or Satan himself, the God of this world? pushing it that's right the pope believes it we're going to talk about that too there's some jesuit connections to charlie darwin and his boys and his gang of nuts uh there, there's 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 a uh, there's a connection between between them okay there's a connection between the jesuits the masons and all of them they all had a hand in in, in evolution in promoting evolution so we're going to talk a little bit about, well, who first, number one, who, who first influenced Darwin to become the God-hater that he was? Who, I mean, here's, listen, you're not born a God-hater. Somebody has to indoctrinate you to hate God. Now, you are born an enemy of the cross, amen, and you choose to sin, and you, and you get into a wicked sin, and everything like that. But, you know, a, a child naturally wants to look up at the heavens and say, well, what's up there? So what happened? Well, Erasmus Darwin happened, his grandfather. He was one of the major influences on him. Remember, remember the scripture we just went over? They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Rasmus hated God. He was Charlie Darwin. He was a very influential man. Because that which may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has showed it unto them. God showed it unto them. They just hate it. They just hate God. That's right, they didn't want to submit. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. You know, someone has to teach you there is no God. Someone has to. And that someone for Darwin was his grandfather. Wouldn't that be something? How would you like to be a grandfather and teach your children that? Wouldn't that be nice? Sit down with your grandchildren, teach them there is no God. You should hate religion. You should hate, hate the God of the Bible. And you should believe that you came from a monkey. You should believe in natural selection. By the way, we haven't got into what natural selection causes and the evil that it's done, uh, the Columbine shooters and everything else. We haven't even got to that. We, don't have, we won't get to that right now. We're not even going to talk about doctrine tonight, really, of evolution. Anyway, as one biographer says, there was a vein of skepticism in the Darwin family. John, John Weller, Charles Darwin growing up in, in Shrewsbury. His, he, there was, the, the whole family was full of skeptics. They're a very influential family, though. In fact... Erasmus was asked by the king at that time to be his personal doctor. A lot of people don't know that. But Erasmus, he, Charlie's grandfather, was, was uh, offered that position. But Charles' paternal grandfather, Erasmus, was a materialist who denied the soul of man and taught that all mental states derive from the motion of particles in the brain. He discarded the Bible and Jesus and adored in the temple of nature, he called it. For him, reason was divine and progress its prophet. Adrian Desmond on Darwin. He invented a speaking machine, a copying machine, and the steering mechanism used in modern cars. His close friends consisted of men such as Benjamin Franklin. Do we remember Benji? Remember what he was a part of? Huh? Oh, he was a good guy, wasn't he? No, he wasn't. He was a fornicator. They found, didn't they find babies buried underneath his uh, dead babies and stuff? Buried, part of the Hellfire Club. Uh-oh, big occultist, hated God. Hey, why is he friends with this guy? I know, they all hate God. That's why. Not hard to see. You know what? Evil, evil communication corrupts the good manners. Say, Ed. One of America's founding fathers, old Benjamin Franklin, the occultist, one of the occultist ones. The occultic ones there. John Mitchell, the father of seismology. John Whitehurst, inventor of the factory time clock. These were all friends with him. John Bakersville, famous printer and type font designer. James Watt, perfecter of the steam engine. And James Brindley, the creator of England's canal system. Erasmus was a fellow of the Royal Society, the first in the line of six generations of Darwins to be so honored. Very influential man. Very influential man. Very wealthy man. All right. 
Erasmus was a moral scoundrel who was fond of sacrificing to both Bacchus and Venus, meaning he loved alcohol and women. Though he gave up drinking for his health's sake, he continued to sacrifice to Venus throughout his life. It means he was a he was a fornicator, yeah. After the death of Polly, Erasmus bore two daughters he bore two daughters out of wedlock with his live in governess, who was twenty two years his junior. He also composed lush erotic verses. He's a pervert. Sexual deviant and a pure pervert. Well, now I wonder why he had to prove that there was no God and that we all evolved. You know, there's always an agenda with that. What usually is the agenda? Oh, you're a wicked pervert that hates God and you, and you don't want to answer to God. That's why. Yeah, that's, that's a good reason. Erasmus says God was a first cause that had some vague part in bringing life into existence but had no role in men's lives. Oh, yeah. He did, you know, something just, create, just made us out of nothing, kind of evolved there, but he really doesn't tell us what to do and there's no rules. Rejecting the true and living God, Erasmus worshipped a distant deity, the vast unknown. By his student years at Cambridge, he had rejected the Bible view of God. At age 23, he referred to God as being a being who had no role in the affairs of men at all. At Cambridge, he was deeply influenced by deism, by the de- to deism by Albert Ramerus, the son of German philosopher Hermann Ramerus. At age 37, Erasmus wrote to Albert and said that he was continuing in the religion you taught us. Would that be German rationalism? Yeah. Yeah, no, there is no miracles. No, there's no miracles. Got to do away with those. Don't you like those people that say, well, I believe the Bible's a good book. No, it's not. If it's not the word of God, it's not a good book. It's a very evil book. Because if it makes me believe that there were actually miracles, that Jesus walked on water, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again from the dead, that, he, that, that, that Moses parted the Red Sea, that all these things happened, if that's the case, if that truly happened, if those things are real, then you know what? If those things aren't real, then you know what? The Bible's not a good book, so stop being a liar, you hypocrite. You sound like a fool. Shut up. I don't even want to hear from you anymore. You're not even an honest person. Is that too straightforward? I'm a little bit excited here. All right. At Cambridge, anyway, so in the second volume, okay, so Darwin, Erasmus Darwin wrote Zoonomia. Did I say that right? Zoonomia. How about that? He wrote a two-volume set on that. And Erasmus identified religion and hell as psychological diseases. Wait a minute, stop. Haven't we heard that before? Wait a minute, didn't we just talk to you about a young man that they, they said was well, we got to have his mental state checked because, I mean, he's got street preaching signs out there, and he, you people believe Jesus are coming, is coming back, and, and God hates sin, and Disney is bad, and, and all these, these other things are wicked. I mean, you actually believe this stuff? We need to have your, well, that's, that's what he said too. Where'd they get it from? Him. They got it from him. Do you see? Do you get it? This is not new. This stuff is not new. It's evolved. Mm -hmm. He identified religion and hell as psychological diseases. One of these supposed psychic afflictions was spes religioso, or superstitious hope, he called. He called this a maniacal hallucination. And in, in insanity that has produced cruelties, murders, massacres into the world. Thus, Erasmus Darwin, the God-hater, who did not distinguish false religion from true, predated the so-called new atheists like Richard Dawkins by more than two centuries. You think Dawkins' argument he got him himself? Really? Come on. These losers don't have an original thought ever. Okay? They're a bunch of losers. They don't have an original thought. Come on. They don't. You shouldn't say that. I know. Forgive me. But the guy's a lying wretch, okay? Listen to what he's saying. Do you understand? I want you to, I want you to think about this. He's blaming murder on this. How many babies have been murdered in America because of evolution? In America. 55 million? 60 million? Whatever it is. We're pushing 60 million? Wait a minute. Oh, I get it. I know. You said that's a potential person. It hasn't evolved yet. How many wars have been started because of evolution? Uh, hello, Hitler. We'll talk about him sometime. Hitler, Stalin. What were they doing? Cleansing? Were they eugenics? Survival of the fittest? How many billions of people died? Hmm? 
Hitler was Catholic, too. He was everything. He was a wicked devil. But anyway, we don't have time to talk about Hitler, but we will talk about Hitler when, when, we, when we talk about uh, the disciples of, of Darwin. Anyway, uh, one of the, anyway, so he calls, it, he, says, he, he calls him that. Another alleged psychological disease that Erasmus identified was Orchi Timor, or the fear of hell. He wrote, many theatric, many theatric preachers among the Methodists successfully inspire this terror and live comfortably upon the folly of their hearers. Listen to me, you wicked devil. First of all, what a wicked devil. Uh, saying that, you know how many preachers went out there and didn't have anything? What do you think George Whitfield had? What do, you think, what do you think the Wesley boys had? What do you think they died with? Why don't you check it out and see what they died with? Nothing! They had nothing. What do you think these Baptists that went out there and preached against, preached hellfire and damnation, what did they end up with? Nothing. Read Obadiah Holmes' will, will you? Read it sometime. See what he left, his last will and testament. You can look it up online. These guys didn't have anything. He's a slander of God-fearing people is what he is. Because he, he doesn't want to admit there's a hell because he's there right now burning there. Is it real now, Erasmus? It's pretty real now, isn't it? After his death, an obituary in the monthly magazine stated that Erasmus told a friend, let us not hear anything about hell. Erasmus said that religious people are credulous dupes and that religious credulity uh, can be cured by knowledge of the laws of nature. What, what, did, what did God say in Romans? When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. What they do? They worship the creature. Right? That's what they do. Erasmus believed in the evolution of life from an original microscopic biological speck to man. How's that work, Erasmus? I don't know. They never say. They can't tell you how it worked is. And the Bible says, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. His family coat of arms featured three scallop shells with the motto, everything from shells, referring to his belief in the evolution of life from the sea. Erasmus was influenced by his friend James Hutton. Okay, now this guy's important. James Hutton's view of long geological ages and uniformitarianism, without this doctrine, the myth of evolution would not be possible. Gap theory, right? Long geological ages, right? Where'd they get that? What happened? Th that book promoted later by I mean, other men like T Thomas Chal Chalmers wrote another book, but these type of books heavily influence people into trying to find a compromise between evolution and science. There is no compromise. The book's true. If you don't like it, you're going to hell. Amen. No compromise. Amen. No membership. That's right. Sorry. It's the way it goes. It's the way it is. That's right. No membership. Amen, brother. That's right. You either believe the Bible or you don't. See if you don't want to. We're not changing it for you. We can't. We've got to answer to God one day for it. Erasmus preached his doctrine of evolution in a popular two-volume set called the Zunami, Zunomia, sorry, whatever, doesn't matter anyway, or the Laws of Organic Life. The books went through many editions in England and America with translations into German, it, Italian, French, and Portuguese. That book promotes the very concepts later popularized by Charles Darwin. Oh, wait, no, Darwin didn't know anything about it. He just kind of, he was, he was sailing on the beagle. And, he, and as he sailed on the beagle, he just stopped off. And all of a sudden, he just, you know, this is what he figured out. And as much study and all his other things. No, he didn't. He read his grandpa's books. He's a stinking liar. The guy was just a rotten, wicked, devil-possessed liar is what he was. It's all he was, was a liar. I know this doesn't sound like a sermon that Ken Ham would preach, does it? It's not dignified enough, but I don't have that good accent to say it in anyway. Right? I just speak in hillbilly or redneck. That's all it is. So anyway. Erasmus believed. Anyway, Dar he, he, okay, later popularized by Charles Darwin, natu natu natural selection, survival of the fittest, sexual selection, homoology, and vestigial organs. We've heard all those before, haven't we? Boy, Charlie's grandpa didn't do him a very good job, did he? Charlie's grandpa helped him go to hell. You be careful what you do, friend. It matters how well you treat your children. 
It matters what you teach your children. It matters what you let them listen to and what they learn. And it matters what you allow their grandparents to tell them and teach them. Amen. It matters. Erasmus believed that everything is risen from an original living filament, which was formed by spontaneous vitality in the primeval ocean. Wait, no. Okay. So I get it. All right. But still. Okay. So there's like some sludge rolling around there. All right. And that soup. Yeah. Yeah. Soup. Okay. And it's just like there. Where'd the soup come from? I don't know. It just was there. Okay. But that seems like to me a more miracle than in the beginning God created. It seems like that's a, like a, like a, a little bit farther of a stretch. I know why you like that one better though. You like the, pri- the, the primordial soup theory. You like that better because there's nobody to answer to. That's why. Okay, I get it. Well, you could just be honest about that and say, I don't want to answer to God. Although you will one day anyway. If you believe in evolution, you're going to die and go to a devil's hell for all of eternity and burn and burn and burn in the place that you don't think exists. And you will answer at the, at the white throne judgment to the God that you don't believe exists. Right. Erasmus said this, Would it be too bold to imagine that in the great length of time since the earth began to exist, perhaps millions of ages before the commencement of the history of mankind, would it be too bold to imagine that all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament which the great first cause endowed with animality, with the power of acquiring new parts, attended with new propensities, directed by irritations, sensations, volley oleations, whatever those are, and associations, and thus possessing the faculty of continuing to improve by its own inherent activity and of delivering down those improvements by generations to its posterity world without end. Um, yeah, that would be a little bit too bold to imagine there, friend. That's actually kind of psychotic. It's crazy. It's insane. It's insanity. To believe that. Erasmus Darwin's book, The Temple of Nature, was published the year after his death. It presents the doctrine of evolution under the guise of lessons he supposedly learned from the goddess Urania, priestess of nature. Goddess? I thought you came from soup. Where'd your goddess come from? Erasmus Darwin borrowed from ancient paganism. Darwin thought to himself of himself as a free thinker, but his religion was nothing more than ancient Babylonian goddess earth worship. In fact, it goes farther back than this. It goes to the lie that the, that the devil told Eve, ye shall be as gods. Evolution was taught in the Garden of Eden. It was taught by the devil. He looked at her and said, hey, you can get up out of this place. You don't have to stay a woman, man. You can evolve to godhood. So now what's it all about? Godhood. What's the new age about? Godhood. Becoming God without the God of the Bible. Becoming your own God and denying the God of the Bible. Denying the authority of the scriptures. One of Erasmus' closest friends was a Unitarian, Josiah Wedgwood. Well, he didn't do him any good, did he? The grandfather of Charles Darwin's wife. Wedgwood was a disciple of Priestley, wicked man, who preached in Birmingham until he was driven out in 1791 by a mob opposed to his religious skepticism and radical socialistic politics. Wow. They were real Christians, so they kicked him out. <laughs> well, they preached him out, I guess it sounds like. Josiah's famous Wedgwood pottery firm even honored Priestley with a medallion featuring his likeness. Erasmus died seven years before Charles' birth, but, the grandson, but his grandson read Zunomia twice in his youth. Belief in evolution passed on to his son, Robert, and reincarnated in his grandson, Charles. It can be seen as the finest of Erasmus's legacy, says Desmond Kinghill. Page 363. Charles's mother, Susanna, was a Unitarian. Her, mother, her father, Joshua Wedgwood, as we have seen, was a prominent Unitarian and personal friend of Erasmus Darwin. Can I stop there and say this to you? If you ever want to destroy a kid, just take him to a church with dead religion. You'll kill his faith. He won't want to know the God of the Bible because it's just a dead book with dead orthodoxy. Doesn't mean anything. It's dead. 
Does it matter to anybody? Does it mean anything? Does it change your life? Does it produce a change in your life when you know the God of the Bible? Just go ahead and stay in a church like that and watch your whole family go to hell. Watch your children go to hell, right? Why? Because you want to play church. That's what the Unitarians, that's what all these devils did back then. The, these Anglicans and all, most of them did, and these Anglican churches that went liberal over there, they, what they do, they just played church. They just showed up, had their little sacerdotal stuff, did all their little ceremonies and all their other stuff, and then what happened? Kids went to hell, became these evolutionists, became the people that destroyed the world. That's what they were. That's what dead religion will do for you. Susanna attended High Street Chapel in Shrewsbury, which had begun to be infected with the unbelief, with the, with unbelief in the 18th century under the pastorate of Job Orton. That Orton did not hold to the full Godhead of Jesus Christ is evident by his comment on the name of the mighty God. In Isaiah 9, 6, he said, the meaning of this I cannot tell. Well, let me help you with it. It says the mighty God. It means that Jesus is the mighty God. Amen. Amen. Yep. That wasn't very hard. You don't even have to have a degree to figure that out. You just have to read it. Amen. Amen. You just have to believe the Bible. But they wanted to deny the Trinity, obviously. Oh, what do we see now? Same thing. They've they got to deny it. They have to. Susanna was educated at the feet of a Unitarian teacher hired by her father. Charles was educated for a short time at a school operated by Case. Today the church is called Shrewsbury Unitarian Church, High Street, and a plaque inside the building says this, to the memory of Charles Robert Darwin, author of The Origin of Species, born in Shrewsbury, February 12, 1809, in early life, a member of an, and a constant worshiper in this church. Wait a minute, stop. Wait a minute. I mean, seriously. You just dedicated a plaque... In a church to a guy that hates God, that denies the, ex the existence and the authority of God, and you place it in your so-called church. Well, it's not a biblical church anyway, so let it be accursed. But anyway, the, the point is that, do you see why this kid, do you see why this kid became what he was? He was around a bunch of dead, dead religion. Why do you think when we go on the street and all these people are like, oh yeah, I went to mass and I did all this and I've been through all this. Yeah, but you've never been to a real church. You've never been around real Christians before that actually believe what they're saying, that actually believe this book and follow it and obey it and, and, and seek to please the Lord in all things. You've never been around those. You've never seen the changing power of God. And because you haven't, that's why you hold to these things you do. That's why you think what you do. What doctrine you hold to does affect your children. Charles, J Charles Darwin's grandfather poisoned his grandson against the Lord. Charles's father, Robert, was also a skeptic. Robert was educated by Unitarians in the same school attended by Susanna. Well, that's not a church. You know what universalism, Unitarianism? Susanna, he was even less orthodox in his faith than Erasmus. Well, that's pretty bad. Darwin and the Darwinian evolution. Ian Taylor says Robert's disbelief extended to the borders of atheism in the minds of men, page 113. He adopted Erasmus's motto, all things were out of shells. It's kind of weird. As his own and displayed it on his book plate, Erasmus Darwin's biographer says that Robert never abandoned his belief in evolution, that's Charles Darwin's father, and that he deserves cre much credit for bringing up Charles in an evolution-friendly atmosphere. Well, we must give credit where credit is due. The sad thing is that all three generations are burning in hell. Suppose they understand natural selection doesn't work out, didn't work out too well. In many sense, then, tormenting him down there as they scream out, I believed your lies, I believed your lies, I believed your lies. Robert greatly helped Charles to bring himself to believe in evolution in defiance of orthodox scientific thinking, said Desmond King Hill in page 359. So con congratulations, you trained your son to be a wicked devil and you used grandpa's books to do it. It was a family affair. Next, Grandpa Darwin's NWO New World Order Masonic Connections. Amen. We're going to talk about that here a little bit. Uh, Darwin's theories on evolution was the first major coup on the mass mindset for the survival of the fittest. No God belief system, which has been prevalent in the last century. This theory, which did not originate with Charles Darwin, was essentially the work of the Lunar Society. Oh, who's that? Oh, they're a bunch of crazy psychos is who they were. But the Lunar Society, they met at the, at the full moon, right? And um, they were actually called first the Lunar Circle. I wonder, what, what do you think they called themselves? They did call themselves lunatics. They did. 
They actually called themselves lunatics, and I agree. I have no problem with that. I agree with their. I agree with their definition. I, I I accept it completely. Good characterization of who they are. Absolutely, who they were. Amen. This theory, which did not originate with Charles, okay, the Lunar Society, a revolutionary organization created to undermine God and overthrow monarchies, which Darwin's family was very involved in. By the end of his life, Darwin himself did not believe the argument, but the theories had taken hold and have since been taught a scientific fact. Darwin didn't know what he believed when he died. He sure didn't believe in the God of the Bible. He hated the God of the Bible. Once more, though, our ideas about who and what we are have been programmed into us. Beliefs which serve the elite and their goal of complete control. Now, now I have a theory. I believe these, I believe Erasmus trained his son and his son trained Charles. And I, I believe they're nothing more than Luciferians. They're all in the Masonic order. They were all trained at Lucifer. Who's the God of the Lodge? Lucifer. Who's the light of the Lodge? Lucifer, what are they all after? Knowledge. Kid didn't stand a chance much, did he? He was the master. So Erasmus was the master of the famous Canongate Lodge in Edinburgh, Scotland. Moreover, he had close ties with the Jacobin Masons. Oops. You know who those guys are, don't you? The Jacobin Masons? That would be the Illuminati. Amen. That would be the, that they would be the ones that would be part of the Illuminati, okay? Um, he had close ties to them. Who were the organizers of the revolution in France at the time? And with the Illuminati, whose prime cause was fostering hostility to religion. That is, Erasmus Darwin was an important name in European Masonic anti-religious organizations. Do you get this? What do you say? Are you trying to tell me that evolution is Luciferian? Yep, that's what I'm saying. But to liar, they listen. People unwittingly and unknowingly today are worshiping Lucifer through evolution. That's exactly what they're doing. That is exactly who they're worshiping because that's exactly where that where it all came from. That's who they're worshiping. So the next time they say, "You, oh, I don't serve any god." Oh yes, you do. <laughs> you worship Lucifer. You believe in evolution? Yep. Well, you worship Lucifer. Mm-hmm. By the way. The French Revolution, wicked, destroyed the country. You know, so that's why people try to compare the French Revolution with the American Revolution. No comparison. You're a bunch of liars. You're not even honest with history. What was different about the American Revolution? Baptist. Baptist. I know that's not very popular today to say that, but it's true. Baptists were the difference. God was with them and preserved them. And thousands of churches were started out of those revivals and out of those awakenings because of those. And John Leland and other men that were a part of that. That's not the same blueprint as what went on. What happened? Well, see, what the devil thought he was going to get away with, he didn't get away with. Why? Because God had a remnant here. And God is, by the way, if you're listening to the Baptist battle for liberty, I will show you, and I have been showing you down through the centuries, how God always had a city, a place for people to dwell, and there was, and, and, the, and religious liberty was in that place, and they've been pockets of it all over the time. I just covered one last week, 150 years, 150 years the Paulations lived in freedom there. They had religious freedom there for 150 years, and they sent out more missionaries and did more for God. So the French and the American Revolution are not the same. Anyway, so Erasmus Darwin, uh, Charles Darwin's father, who too, who too had been made a member of the Masonic Lodge. For this reason, Charles Darwin received the inheritance of Masonic teachings from both his father and his grandfather. Erasmus Darwin hoped to have his son Robert develop and publish his theory. But it would be his grandson, Charles, who would undertake the enterprise. Although it came some time later, Erasmus Darwin's Temple of Nature was finally revised by Charles Darwin. Well, Charlie wasn't very honest about Grandpa's work. He kind of lied a little bit and said he had just invented all this stuff, and it was just all up, all him that did it. But you have to do that. See, there always has to. The devil always has a front man. He always has a front man, just like the Jesuits always have a front man. Always got fall guys in front of him. Darwin's views did not have the weight of scientific theory. It was merely the expression of a naturalist doctor that accepts that nature has creative power. 
Okay, in comes the, the occult Hellfire Club member Benjamin Franklin, who was friends in the Lunar Circle or Lunar Society. Darwin's theories on evolution was the first major coup. Okay, we talked about that. Uh, we looked at the membership there. Oh, these guys, look at the membership. Both grandfathers of Charles Darwin were the founders of the Industrial Revolution, Matthew Bolton and James Watt. Okay, all these men and founders of the American Revolution, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, the founders of the Scientific Revolution, Joseph Priestley and Anton Leviashar, and much else besides. All of these men worked together. What were they pushing? They were pushing Freemasonic order. They were pushing Luciferianism. They, were, they had connections to Jesuits. They had connections to a lot of people. And when the Jesuits were done with them, they killed them. They had him put to death. Well, I don't know about Benjamin Franklin, but, but Thomas Jefferson and uh, George Washington and John Adams. And on July 4th, that wasn't an accident, was it? All these men worked together. Why? They were all Luciferians. All these men were very wealthy. They were inventors. They had all the knowledge. I want you to think about something. I mean, just look at this for a second. If you would. Okay, see this iPad? Now, do you think that all of this came from just human mind? Do you think some of this technology could come from people that are devil possessed? Think it's possible? Well, talk to Steve Jobs. Well, don't talk to him. He's dead. Don't do that. That'd be bad. Don't talk to Steve Jobs. I mean, read his articles. <laughs> that would be bad. We don't do we don't necromancy here, okay? So don't talk to Steve Jobs. That came out really bad. <laughs> anyway, don't do that. That'd be a bad idea to do that. Uh, but anyway, um, but read, read some of their writings, what they say. Automatic writing. They were led by devils. That's what they were. Mm -hmm. When you take God out, you bring the devil in. You get that, right? If you take the Lord Jesus Christ out, you, bring, you make an environment for the devil to come in. I don't know why that's so hard for people to understand. It's pretty easy to understand. Okay, I'm going to keep moving. All right. Uh, so they would have their meetings on, the night, on a night with a full moon, these guys would. James Watt was a Scottish inventor and mechanical engineer who had formed a successful partnership with Matthew Bolton. He owned a Soho manufacturing company in Birmingham uh, in 1775. Okay, so anyway, so these guys brought together all of their plans, all right, together. When discussing the Lunar Society, one can only imagine the scene of so many leading and important intellectuals that sat around the dining discussing a groundbreaking scientific topic. Why is they became fools? That's right. That's what they were doing. A bunch of Luciferians that got light from Lucifer or knowledge to divine a devise a plan to erase God from man's understanding, to try to pervert the God of the Bible. That's what their goal was. That's what their goal's always been. To use his very... Do you understand... The devil's plan is to use God's own creation against him. Do you get that? That's what he did. That's what he did with Eve. That's what he's done with evolution. To use God's own creation against him. That's the plan. It's always been the plan. All right, next. Charles Darwin's devils and his doctrines. All right? Dr. Darwin's authority in the Darwin family was patriarchal. Now, this is talking about the, the, the father of, of Charles Darwin for a minute here. His family was patriarchal, which is good. That's a good thing, actually, but you better teach right if you are. At six feet, two inches, and 328 pounds, when he was present, every conversation had to be exactly pleasing to the master's ear. Under these conditions, it is extremely unlikely that there would have been any Bible talk in the Darwin home. That's from In the Minds of Men, page 113. He was a big goon, that's right. He, he was elected to the Plinian, Darwin was elected to the Plinian Society in 1826 at a time when it had been penetrated by radical students, fiery, free-thinking Democrats who demanded that science be based on physical causes, not supernatural forces. Darwin was invited for the very reason that his grandfather Rasmus was a skeptic, because he was a skeptical evolutionist. Darwin's membership was sponsored by William Brown, who had no time for souls and saints, he said. Brown hated the Bible and the doctrine of creation. And when Charles Bell proposed that the human face reflects man's moral nature and is an evidence of divine creation, Brown opposed him. Brown stirred up a great controversy when he lectured that mind and consciousness are not spiritual entities separate from the body. They are simply spin-offs from the brain's activity. The other student inducted into the Plinian Society with Darwin was the Unitarian educated William Gregg, who was just as heretical as Brown and hated creationism. Now, listen. You're always told by evolutionists, well, you know, that we don't, they, don't, they don't really hate God. A lot of them say that, well, no, I mean, I believe there's a God or whatever. And, you know, I believe God did evolution. No, you see, these guys, they hated God. 
They mocked and scoffed at God's creation, and they hated him. That's what their whole goal was, was to hate on God. That's what they did. Darwin's closest friend at Edinburgh. By the way, could you imagine sending your children to these devils? Could you imagine that? Well, listen, if you take your kids to public school, you're sending them to those devils. I'm just telling you, folks. Hey, if you take your kids to public school or, or, or those, those colleges, you are sending them to those devils. They're just, you're leading them to the slaughter, just like Darwin was. It's no different than what Darwin's family taught him. It's no different. It's worse. Darwin's closest friend at Edinburgh was a professor, Robert Edmund, Edward Grant, another member of the Plain Society. He was an uncompromising evolutionist. See, all these people helped form who Darwin was, who believed that the origin and evolution of life were due simply to physical and chemical forces, all obeying the natural laws. A man for whom nothing was scared, he was savagely anti-Christian. Nothing was sacred, excuse me. He was savagely anti-Christian. Grant loved Erasmus's, Erasmus Darwin's book so much, he believed in spontaneous generation of life, from monads, what's a monad, or elementary living particles, and held that, that, sponge is the, that, that the sponge is the parent of higher animals. The sponge. Now that would be a miracle. SpongeBob? <laughs> SpongeBob? It's scary, I'm telling you. Though Darwin had already studied his grandfather's tsunami, he read the French evolutionist Lamarck. Lamarck, I think I'm saying that right. Including his well-known lecture on species transmutation, it was Grant who brought it to life, and it was Grant who, show, who showed Darwin what transmutationist research should look like. Erasmus Darwin had provided the, evolution, the speculative framework, including ideas that Charles would make famous, such as common descent with modification, sexual selection, the survival of the fittest. It was transmutationist research that could provide the evidence. By the way, Lamarck was a Jesuit. What was he doing translating, talking about transmutations? What was he? Now, why would a Jesuit? I mean, I thought they were, weren't they the order of Jesus? Weren't they like, weren't they supposed to be the good guys? I mean, standing up for God and everything. What would a Jesuit be doing Working on transmutations and, 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 and helping provide theories for evolution. What would he be doing doing that? Well, they're devils. That's why. They hate God. They're Luciferian too. Lamar, he was a French botanist and zoologist. He's better known for his inheritance of acquired traits theory. In his youth, Lamarck spent a few years in a Jesuit seminary, followed by service in the French army. Afterwards, he studied botany and, in short order, became an expert on the subject. He was made assistant botanist to French Royal Botanical Gardens and remained there until 1793. Lamarck published a series of books on in invertebrate zoology, and these philosophic zool zoology stated his theory of evolution. Darwin was also influenced by, by this man. Which was uh, he was influenced by this man, which was a challenge to creationism. Lamarck's false idea of acquired attributes was largely accepted by Darwin and later promoted in his writings. Lamarck taught, for example, that the giraffe's neck became elongated when giraffes stretched their necks to reach leaves higher in the trees, and resulting in elongation was passed on to subsequent generations. Well, one day he just needed to stretch his neck, so he stretched it, and the next one was born with a stretched neck. Now, that's stupid. There's a little stretch in that, isn't there? Darwin also attended Robert Jameson lectures in Edinburgh entitled Origin of Species and Animals. Charles Lyell, another man that influenced him. Charles Lyell. Darwin was more heavily influenced during the voyage of re on his voyage of the Beagle by reading the principles of geology by Charles Lyell, which he studied attentively. Lyell's uniformitarianism was a bold and brass denial of the Bible's teaching of divine creation and the universal flood, and this was his express objective. Darwin described Lyell as thoroughly liberal in his religious beliefs, or rather disbeliefs. Lyell was a personal friend and supporter of John William Colenso, the Anglican Bishop of Natal, who likened the Pentateuch to the mythical accounts of King Arthur's court. That's a great bishop. Isn't that a great bishop? Wouldn't it be nice if your bishop stood in front of you? Oh, wait, my father, when he was in the Catholic Church, had a, had a, Roman, had a Roman Catholic father come up to him and tell him that. said, well, the first five books of the Bible are mythological. They're not real. Well, where did he get that from? Right there. But Lyle was more subtle. 
he obtained he abstained from attacking the Bible publicly, only so as to undermine it covertly. Well, that sounds awful, Jesuit. Which he considered more effective. Darwin said Lyle is most firmly convinced that he has shaken the faith in the deluge far more eff- efficiently by never having said a word against the Bible than if he had acted. Hey, if they've acted otherwise. Darwin in the Darwinian Revolution. Page 387. In other words, he was a wolf in sheep's clothing. In a letter to a friend in 1827, Lyle even likened biblical Christianity to an idol. Darwin on the beagle, reading books against the Bible, tries to make others think he's orthodox. See, see, what he tried to do was, listen, the devil always does this. By the way, Jesuits do this. They get a guy, and they get a following for that guy. They tack into that guy, and then they let that guy fall off into atheism or wickedness or vileness or disgusting or a cult or anything else. And they say, see? And they lead a whole bunch of people off the cliff. That's what Darwin was doing. Darwin was leading about Darwin was trying to make people think that, well, he was an Orthodox Christian and he was saved, and then he just lost his faith because he was sailed on the Beagle and went and saw some turtles and stuff and said, Hey, it's not real. Do you actually believe that he was saved? Do you actually believe this man was a Christian? Absolutely not. He wasn't a Christian. He never believed. He never confessed Christ as Lord and Savior. He never submitted to the Lordship of Christ. He never bowed his knee and, and, and believed the Bible. He wouldn't have had to sail on the beagle if he'd have done that. Now, would he have? Whilst on board the beagle, I was quite orthodox, he said. But I had gradually come by this time to see that the Old Testament from its manifestly false history of the world with the Tower of Babel, the rainbow as a sign, etc., and from its attribu- attributing to God the feelings of a revengeful tyrant was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus or the beliefs of any barbarian by further reflecting that the clearest evidence would be requisite to make any man believe in the miracles of which Christianity is supported, that the more we know of the fixed laws of nature, the more incredible do miracles become. That the men at the time were ignorant and credulous to a degree, almost incomprehensible by us, that the Gospels cannot be proved to have been written simultaneously with the events by such reflections as these, which I give not as having the least novelty or value, but as they influence me, I gradually come to disbelieve in Christianity as a divine revelation. His autobiography, page 8586. Wicked liar. You liar. You were sucking up and, and, and reading your grandfather's books. You were being indoctrinated in the Masonic order. You're a liar. You were a spiritist and everything else. You're a liar. And you hung around everybody that hated the Bible. You t- Listen, friend, let me tell you something. You tell me you love God and you're a Christian. You hang around a bunch of people that hate God. You're a liar too. Right. Amen. Darwin said, I saw more of Lyle than any other man both before and after my marriage. I, what do I do with that? Where do I go with that? I think I just move on for safety's sake. But I believe you, Charlie. And I think you were a little squirrely too. But anyway, I'm going to move on, okay? I'm going to get a bunch of hate mail on YouTube or something on this stuff. They're going to be like, I can't believe you said that like that. I don't like the way you say that. I don't care if you like the way I say it. I never do anyway, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, Darwin said I saw – anyway, I'm not going to read that again. That's gross. The science of geology is enormously <laughs> indebted to Lyle. He said this, the science of, the, uh, of geology is enormously indebted to Lyle, more so, so I believe, than to any other man who ever lived. Lyle was one of the men who urged Darwin to write the, on the origin of species. By 1836, Charles' skepticism was complete. By his own admission, he had concluded that the Bible's miracles were not credible to any sane man. But primordial soup was. How do you go from there? How do you go from soup to this? How do you do that? Like his grandfather Erasmus, Charles Darwin especially hated the doctrine of eternal torment. (gasps) Wait a minute. Now you're going to start getting to the meat of the problem here. I don't like what it says. Not that it's not real. I don't like what it says. Like I had some ambassador down in Minneapolis, those people that that go right, go boop, and they they check the street lights. I don't know what. I guess they're supposed to be cleaning the streets when they walk up. Well, he thought he was going to clean me, I guess. I don't know what he thought he was going to do, but he comes up to me. He starts telling me I can't. He he said, you can't be using that speaker out here. You need, you're going to. You know, I'm going to call the police and you go ahead, call them. You can't be using that out here. And then he, as he kept talking, then he said, who do you think you are? You can ridicule people out here like this. Oh, I said, you don't like what I'm saying. Okay, well, we'll say it louder then. 
Darwin said this, Thus disbelief crept over me at, the very, at a very slow rate, but was at last complete. The rate was so slow that I felt no distress and have never since doubted, even for a single second, that my conclusion was correct. I can indeed hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true. Listen. Darwin said this, For if so, the plain language of the text seems to show that men who do not believe, and this would include my father, my brother, and almost all my best friends, will be everlastingly punished. And this is a damnable doctrine. Oh, page 87 of his autobiography. Oh, I get it, Charlie. You don't want to answer to God. And you know all your family. By the way, did you see that? will be eternally punished. Even a lost reprobate like Darwin understood hell's eternal. Why can't Christian YouTubers figure that out? Anyway, I'm going to keep going. In 1871, Darwin put his stamp of approval on the index, the weekly publication of the very radical free religious association. The publication was dedicated to the spirit of reform without deference to the authority of the Bible, the church, or the Christ. The Christ? Who says the Christ like that? Occultus. Yeah. Annie Besant. Uh, what's the other? Blavatsky. What's the other lady's name? Uh, the one. Yeah, Alice Bailey. The Christ. They say it like that for a reason. The editor, Francis Abbott, was the author of Truths for the Times, which boldly opposed the Bible and Christianity. Darwin said, I have now read Truths for the Times, and I admire them from my innermost, inmost heart, and I believe that I agree with every word. Later, he had Abbott change that to I agree to almost every word, but he added the points in which I doubtfully differ are unimportant. By the way, Abbott, the one that wanted to write against the Christ and everything, not have any specifics, committed suicide at his wife's grave in 1903. Why? There's no hope in evolution, friend. There's no hope in the resurrection and evolution. Killed himself at his wife's grave. In spite of his growing boldness and unbelief, Darwin continued to fear. He was afraid. See, Darwin didn't want to be called a devil. That's what he was afraid of. He didn't want anybody to call him a devil. Well, he was a devil. But he didn't want anybody to call him a devil. He didn't want to know how anti-God and anti-Christ he really was. He was a liar. He lived a lie. He was a phony. In spite of his growing boldness and unbelief, Darwin continued to fear. After the publication of On the Origin of Species, he described a nagging fear that I have devoted my life to a fantasy. Desmond Darwin, page 477. Yes, you have. And you went to hell with that fantasy. Darwin's wife was a non-believing Anglican. Darwin's wife, Emma, was a Unitarian-influenced Anglican. She was trained at the feet of the Unitarians, hired by her skeptic father. We talked about that already. She was deeply worried about Charles' lack of faith and implored him to be careful, perhaps even fearful of casting off what Jesus had done for you for your benefit as well as for that of all the world. This brought Charles to tears, but he hardened his heart to her pleas. She wasn't saved either, by the way. She was a Unitarian. She wasn't, she wasn't born again. By 1874, she joined. Listen, folks, you may wonder, why, why is Pastor Cooley so hard on doctrine and so straight on everything to preach against him and do all this? Here's why right here. So I don't want your children to be confused. You're not going to be confused. You're going to be very, well, you understand what we believe here, amen? Listen, by 1874, Charles Darwin's wife joined Charles's brother in dabbling in spiritism was open to the possibility of communicating with the dead. She's bringing devils around. Well, Charlie had enough of them. So Darwin's wife was channeling devils. What was Charlie into then? What was happening with him? He was afraid of being branded the devil's chaplain, he said. Well, I will brand you that. You were the devil's chaplain, for sure. He was destitute of faith, yet terrified of skepticism. When Darwin did come out of his closet to embear his soul to a friend, he used a telling expression. He said it was like confessing a murder. The full title to Adrian Desmond's biography to Darwin, The Life of a Tormented Evolutionist. Good book, right? You can get into reading that one. He cut him. Listen, this is what he did. And we're almost done here. I'm going to hurry. He cut himself off. 
ducked parties and declined engagements. He even installed a mirror outside of his study window to spy on visitors as they came up his drive. For years after reaching his rural retreat, he refused to sleep anywhere else unless it was a safe house, a close relative's home. This was a worried man. He was living a double life with double standards, unable to broach his species work with anyone except Erasmus, his brother, for fear that he branded irresponsible, irreligious, or worse. It began to tell in the pit of his stomach. It was eating him alive because he knew there was a God and he was warring against that God. Darwin Darwin suffered much of his life. I believe he was possessed, and I'm going to show you that. Darwin suffered much of his life from debilitating sickness, so much so that he was largely a recluse and invalid during his last 30 years of his life. Even in 1841, nearly 20 years before he published The Origin of Species, he described himself as a dull, old, spiritless dog who only rarely had visitors. His sickness took the form of stomach problems, heart palpitations, vomiting, eczema, A third of his working life was spent doubled up, trembling, vomiting, and dousing himself in icy water. The Huxleys described Darwin's house as an infirmary where no one got well. Here, illness was the norm and health a strange affliction. A strange sanatorium. Did I say that right? Sanatorium? Got a weird name. Where the family turned up like guests for the evening meal. That's that's what... Desmond Huxley, Huxley, page 291. Before the publication of The Origin of Species, Darwin had uncomfortable palpitations of the heart. Now listen to this. I believe he was possessed. But before the publication, he had Darwin had uncomfortable palpitations of the heart and a terrible long fit of vomiting. Judgment of God right here. God gave him over to his devils. You, want to be, you don't want to believe in me? Okay. I'll give you over to the devils you want to worship. You don't think God will do that? Well, you better think again, friend. He will. What it, what it, what happened? God, God will do it every once. Amen. When it comes to that. And by the way, this man was about to cause the most, some of the most wicked destruction known to man. And this is what he said. Listen to this. This is why we have to go preach outside of abortion clinics tomorrow. Darwin had uncomfortable palpitations of the heart and a terrible long fit of vomiting. And upon the first side of the book, one leg swelled like elephantitis. Tysis. His legs swelled up when he saw the book. No, the origin of species. His eyes almost closed up, covered with a rash and fiery boils. You know, there was a there was a man that wrote. Let me tell you something real quickly here. There was a man that wrote some comic books. And when he had satanic visitations from devils, he broke out in boils. We know that Job, when he was afflicted, he had boils, didn't he? All right? By the devil when he was afflicted, when the devil went after him and touched his body. This is not an accident. Amen. He hid out for the next two months as a, at, a, at a hydropathic spa, living in hell, waiting for the Fuhrer to die down. The following description of Darwin's condition, 1848, was typical. Waves of dizziness and despondency swept over him. Through the winter, he suffered a dreadful vomiting fits every week. His hands started trembling, and he was not able to do anything one day out of three. There were disquieting new symptoms, involuntary twitching, fainting feelings, and black spots before his eyes. For 25 years, extreme spasmodic daily and nightly flatulence. Can't get away from that flatulence. I'm trying, but it just keeps coming up. Occasional vomiting on two occasions prolonged during months. Vomiting proceeding by shivering, hysterical crying, dying sensations of half faint or half faint. And copious, very pallid urine, whatever that means. Now, now vomiting in every passage of flatulence preceded by ringing of ears, treading on air and vision. Focus in black dot, black dots, air fatigues, especially risky, brings on the head symptoms, nervousness when Emma leaves me, he said. He got real scared when his wife left. When his wife wasn't around him, like she went to the store or something, went to go pick something up. By 1871, the year he published The Descent of Man, Darwin was a confirmed invalid who sat engulfed in fog, downhearted, drawing up his will. He was a liar. He was an agnostic liar is what he was. Darwin protested that his book on origin of species was not a product of something that was in the air and denied that men's minds were prepared for it. 
He tried to lie and say that he invented it all, but he didn't, obviously. There were other men. Um, Jacques Barzin, uh, clearly the spirit of evolution, hovered over the cradle of the new century. There were a lot of other men that influenced Darwin. He tried to say he got it all himself. The facts of the Darwin-Wallace relationship have only come to light in the recent years. Okay, so there's just some facts here about um, – I'm just going to skip over this part here. Oh, by the way, Dar- Darwin was warned. There are other men that, that brought about the doctrine of natural selection, but I can cover that when I, when I cover some of those doctrines. That's fine. Uh, Darwin was warned of the destruction of his doctrine. Many men disagreed with Darwin's doctrine of evolution in his lifetime, even in the Church of England. Many of the most influential scientists disagreed with him, and they warned of the social consequences of his principle. They warned him. Adam Sedgwick, a professor of geology at Cambridge, told Darwin that some parts of his origin he found laughable and others he read with sorrow. He said this, because I think them utterly false and grievously mischievous. Sedgwick called the origin a dish of rank materialism, cleverly cooked up for no other reason, I am sure, except to make us independent of a creator. Ronald Clark, the survival of Charles Darwin. Sedgwick solemnly warned Darwin about trying to divorce nature from the moral or metaphysical and prophesied that if such a break were made, humanity would suffer a damage that might brutalize it and sink the human race into a lower grade of degradation than any into which it has fallen since its written records tell of its history. He warned of it. Darwin didn't care. Even Even Charles Lyell, that wicked guy, Remember him? The father of uniformitarian geology was tormented over the fear that Darwin's doctrine would result in human degradation. Yeah, Paul, we know about that, don't we? You're going to go see some human degradation over there in front of a place that causes human degradation. Life means nothing to those people. He agonized about the moral consequences, fearing that humanity would lose its noble rank and submerge in brutal nature. Countless others issued the same warning. And this is exactly what has happened. The ascent of atheistic evolution has been accompanied by unspeakable moral degradation and brutalization from Stalin to Hitler to Mao. to Mao, From legalized abortion to child pornography. Oh, yeah, we didn't talk about that, did we? Kinsey and evolution. From euthanasia to bestiality. Hey, you're all just a bunch of animals, right? If a man is an animal, then there is no compelling reason why he should not pursue any inclination. Do you understand that? That, That's where it's at. And if there is no creator, there is no basis for absolute morality. If there's no creator, there is no absolutes. Nobody to answer to. The death of Darwin, having rejected the Bible and the God of the doctrine of eternal life, and God and the doctor of eternal life, Darwin was left with no meaning in life and bleak future in which is doomed to perish in a dying universe. With respect to immortality, he said this, nothing shows me how strong and almost instinctive a belief it is as the consideration of the view now held by most physicists, namely that the sun with all the planets will in time grow too cold for life unless indeed some great body dashes into the sun and thus gives it fresh life. Believing as I do that man in the distant future will be a far more perfect creature than he is now. It is an intolerable thought that he and all other sentient beings are doomed to complete annihilation after such long, continued, slow progress. Before his death, Darwin professed no assured and ever-present belief in the existence of a personal God or of a future existence with retribution and reward. Desmond Darwin, page 636. Interestingly, though, the last words of this man, you know what they were? Who had no belief in God were this. Oh, God, oh, Lord, God. Everybody believes in God on their deathbed. He died and went to hell. Every agnostic and every atheist believes in God in his heart of hearts. Darwin was buried. Now listen to this. This is the apostle. This is a wicked. Darwin was buried in Westminster Abbey with a full-blown Anglican funeral. Here's a guy that hated God. Absolutely hated him. Hated his doctrine. Denied it. Denied the Bible. Denied, denied the creator. The elders of science, state, and church, the mobility of birth and talent were in attendance. It was called the greatest gathering of intellect that was ever brought together in our country, in England. 
the Darwins and the Wedgwoods gathered in the Jer- Jerusalem chamber. Oh. All right, this is going to get you here. Hold on. Where one of the committees had met to work on the King James Bible. And where, more recently, the English Revised Committee, led by Westcott and Horde, had deliberated. Well, that explains it. He already cursed it. <laughs> yes, they did. We, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Well, they, they believed in the ghosty, ghostly guild and all kinds of weird stuff. Among his pallbearers were the old ex-clubbers Huxley and Hooker and New Ager Alfred Wallace. We'll talk about them later. The coffin was draped in black velvet and covered with white flowers. Choristers sang, I am the resurrection. A special hymn composed for the occasion was taken from the book of Proverbs. Incongruously, it began, happy is the man that findeth wisdom and getteth understanding. And ended with, and ended with, his, he weighs our ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. As the coffin was lowered into the grave, the, the, the choruser sang, His body is buried in peace, but his name liveth evermore. Deceived. Deceived people. That was Darwin and his, and his devilish influences and the people that influenced his life and his grandpa and all that. That's the beginning of this. There'll be others. There are going to be a lot of other sermons that are going to cover this. So you understand what happened. If you think Darwin was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. I haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg of evil that these people have done. This is Darwin is not even the tip of it. He is just the tip of it. Okay, it gets much worse. Much worse what they taught, what they did, how it affects us today. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for all you do for us. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you please would uh, help us all to sink into our hearts. Help us understand the war we're in. This was a war against God. That's all evolution is. They hate God. This town hates this church, Lord, because we stand against evolution, because we stand against its wickedness. And we give it, and, and we, 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 Come to them, Lord, and we tell them the truth. We preach the word of God to them. We bring the truth to these sinners and show them with their, with their professors and their, their intellect and everything else, Lord, that they've denied the God of the Bible and they're going to hell. And they say things like, you can't tell us we're going to hell. Oh, yes, we can. And we certainly will. As long as there's breath in us, we'll warn you to flee from the wrath to come. There is a God in heaven. You will answer that creator. Bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask him to forgive your sins and cleanse you and repent of your sins today and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the only answer for those that are in despair. That is the only answer for the resurrection, the life, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray, Father, that we would understand the importance of all this. In Jesus' great name we pray. And for his sake we pray. Amen.